I'm, I'm uh, toying with just reading it straight out instead of, you know, trying to ad lib it. So it looks good. I don't remember the one that's on your website. Did you did you put this in instead of the other one? You said you didn't like the other one. I need I need to update my website. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's on your to do list. Okay. Are we letting them in, Michaela? Yep. Yep. People should be starting to come in now, and we'll be live on Facebook in a minute. If you see me bobbing and weaving, I'm trying to get my dog to calm down. He's already had his quota of green beans. Okay, Mary, you can start. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the book club at the center. My name is Mary Kozub and I'm an educator at the Birchfield Penny Arts Center. And we're really delighted that you're here with us this evening. For those of you joining us for the first time, I'd like to share a little bit about who we are. The book club began some 10 years or so ago, 2011, I believe, as a docent initiative. We our book club that features works by authors from our region. This aligns with the center's mission to support and celebrate the rich diversity and many talents in our Western New York community. Since that time, we have graded over 16 living authors. Invi I'm introducing them to our docents and to our museum goers and our families, etc. And we're really excited to introduce Lisa Marie Redman to you tonight. In the pre-COVID days, we would be in the boardroom with coffee and brownies and sometimes, or I should say often, wine and cheese. Uh, but now that we're online, we have the ability to reach a wider audience. And many of you emailed me this past week telling me how much you appreciate that we are online now. Once we get back to normal and we're almost there, the center is now open. We will be doing some kind of a hybrid. hybrid so. I want to assure everyone that we will continue online. So again, tonight is going to be a wonderful evening. As I mentioned already, we're going to be meeting with and chatting with author Lisa Marie Redman and her book, The Secrets They Left Behind. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce Michaela Waros, for those of you who don't know her, another educator at the center who will share the mechanics of tonight's programs. So Michaela, if you'd be kind enough to do that. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, just so we can go through a quick tutorial before we get started with the book club um, to ask questions to Lisa tonight, uh, please use the Q&A function. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. So you can put all of your questions in there and I will be asking them on your behalf to Lisa. You can use the chat function to chat amongst yourselves, but please use the Q&A for any questions you have. Um, also, to let you know that we are also streaming this live to Facebook, so those viewing there, I will be checking the comment section too for questions, so you can still ask questions through the comment section on Facebook. And we are recording this session, um, so if you can't watch the whole thing or wanted to watch it and want to watch it later, um, you can always request a copy. So, there you go. Thank you, Michaela. I now like to you to meet Jasira Gard, a faithful Birchfield Penny Art Center docent who has given many, many tours and has done a number of book clubs. She will be tonight's facilitator and she has the honor and pleasure of introducing Lisa. So Jasira. Thanks, Mary. Um, I'll try to zip through Lisa's bio because it'll be much more fun to hear from her. But in that noise in the background is my dog who's going to put his two cents in. Um, she's a retired cold case homicide detective from Buffalo. 
and she writes a series, the Cold Case Investigation Series. The latest book is A Full Cold Moon. And the next one coming out, which is due out in July, is called The Parting Glass. And for Lucky, we'll get a little sneak preview. The Secrets They Left Behind, her standalone thriller, came out in April 2020. Her short fiction has appeared in numerous publications and anthologies, including Buffalo Noir, which we're going to do in the book club, Down and Out, the magazine, and Mystery Tribune. As a detective, she handled a number of high profile cases. A member of the Bike Path Rapist Task Force, she collaborated with officers from multiple jurisdictions to identify and collect evidence resulting in the arrest and conviction of Altinio Sanchez as a bike path killer. Sanchez, for those of you who don't recall, it was a serial killer who terrorized the Western New York community for three decades. She was also involved in uncovering evidence that led to the exoneration and release of Anthony Capozzi after he served 22 years in prison for crimes um, committed by Sanchez. Lisa also helped uncover crucial DNA evidence leading to the exoneration and release of Linda Jack in 2007 who was convicted in 1994 for the murder of her daughter. Ms. DeJack was the first woman in the United States to have her murder conviction overturned based on DNA evidence. Lisa's appeared on numerous television shows, including Dateline, The Nightmare Next Door, and Murder by Numbers. She lives in Western New York with her husband, two kids, an energetic puppy, and one ungrateful cat. So Lisa, I'm hoping you might start us off by reading us a little bit from, tell us what you're gonna read it from and welcome, welcome to the book club. Well, first off, I'd like to say thank you for having me. This is so wonderful um, to be here, to be virtual with everyone tonight. I'm so appreciative. And I'd like to start off if I could uh, with the prologue of the secrets they left behind. And from there, talk a little bit about how my previous job as a police officer directly led to my current job as a full-time author. Prologue, Wednesday, December 28th, Christmas break. Skylar slammed the front door behind them as they rushed in against the biting winter wind. The three girls kicked their boots off in unison, scattering snow around the hallway. It immediately began to melt and sink into the carpet, leaving dark splotches in the plush pile. The house was dark but warm and silent as the girls stripped off their winter coats and hats. Their escape complete, they stood in the hallway, soaking the remaining melting snow into their socks, holding their outerwear looking at each other. Olivia was the first one to speak. This is bad. The hallway led directly into the formal living room with his couch no one ever sat on and its chairs that had to be dusted. Skylar threw her coat on the far end of the show couch and her two friends followed suit, piling theirs on top. Olivia pulled her cell phone from her purse and checked it. No new messages. She needed to think. The grandfather clock in the corner bonged loudly. They didn't have much time before her parents came home. Skylar went over to the pristine, less than state-of-the-art entertainment center that never got used and clicked on the television. Her wild blonde hair was matted to her head from her knit hat that now lay limply on the pile. She hated that hat, but it was freezing out and there was no way around not wearing one if you wanted to keep your ears. Remote in hand, she stared at the flat screen and flicked through the channels. With the other hand, she spun the daisy wheel on the old-fashioned iPod Nano tucked into the docking station looking for a song. The noise of the TV mixed with the music of the stereo in an assault on the ears, but Skylar was looking for white noise, something to focus on without focusing. Neither Olivia nor Emma said anything. You could still see the wet stain running up the side of Skylar's tight jeans where Joe had splashed beer on her. She was seething, and if she'd had the proper target right then, she'd have smashed something. Emma sat down in an overstuffed floral armchair 
cradling her head in her hands and asked, now what? Look, I'll take care of it, okay, Skylar snapped. She was frantically texting something, eyes locked on her cell screen. Emma fell silent, staring at Skylar's stocking feet, falling into a position of defeat. Olivia's cell only had one bar left. I'm calling Kayla. She's not answering any of my texts. She doesn't even know what's going on. She dumped the cell into her purse and jumped up, going into the kitchen to use the house phone. Skylar turned from the entertainment center, eyes rimmed with red. She watched Emma's blank expression getting more and more agitated by the minute. She wanted to scream at her. She wanted to kill Joe. She wanted to go home, but things had to get fixed. And she was the only one of them who knew what to do. For once, she had to be the responsible one. Olivia came back into the living room. What'd you tell her, Skylar demanded. Nothing, I just wanted her to know why we left. She said Joe carried on for a while and then she went home. She was just walking in when I called. She asked what happened and I told her I didn't want to get into it again. Again? You know what I mean. Olivia tried to hold on to the fact that they would all be back in school once winter break was over, except maybe Skylar. Olivia could do without this whole mess. She thought she'd miss this town when she went away for freshman year. Now she wished she'd never come back. Nothing ever changed. And now she knew there was this whole big world out there and she could walk away from Kelly's Falls and never come back. But that had been her plan all along, right? The sound of a car pulling in the driveway made all three of them swing their heads toward the front picture window. There was a tense silence as the car idled in the driveway. The headlights were mirrored in Emma's eyes. Olivia swallowed hard and said, someone's here. So that starts off my standalone, The Secrets They Left Behind, which is the story of three missing girls. The three that we just saw or heard from that uh, in the prologue, they disappear without a trace. And my main character in this book, uh, a young police officer named Shay, is brought in by the FBI to go undercover to try to figure out what happened to them. And this book is a work of fiction. It is not based on any real crime, but I did use my own background on the Buffalo Police Department. This takes place in a fictional town called Kelly's Falls. I did use my own background on the Buffalo Police Department uh, with some undercover work that I did to help with my character's motivations. And to get into my, my police work, because it is directly tied into the, the fiction that I write, I was a police officer for 22 years. And I got on the job very young, like my main character in The Secrets They Left Behind, she's 23. I was 22 when I got on the job. I was, a, I was a senior in college. I had 10 classes left and I took the police exam and lo and behold, they hired me. And this was in the early nineties. Um, um, and I found myself going from a college student to you know, a rookie police officer. And so, my main character is also a rookie police officer. Um, and she look and she's very young looking, and which is why she's picked for this assignment to try to figure out what happened to these three college freshmen. And so they put her in undercover. And from my own experience, you can become very, very invested in a case. And prior to going online, we had been talking about uh, true crime books and um, Mary Koza had brought up a book by Michelle McNamara uh, that's been in the news, you know, the last couple of years about the Golden State Killer. And she talks in the book about becoming uh, consumed people, you know, sort of crowdsourcing these true crime um, cases and becoming consumed by them. And my main character in the secrets they left behind becomes consumed trying to, you know, find out what happens to these girls. And as a rookie cop, I spent five and a half years on patrol. And then I got made detective and they put me in the, the sex offense squad, which has now been renamed the special victims unit uh, for the Buffalo police department. And on my very first day in, the 
um, special victims unit, my lieutenant, who was still the lieutenant there, came up to me with a binder. And he said to me, you know, these are some cases that our detectives have been working on. You know, um, if you would be interested, you know, would you like to take these cases over? And I opened the binder and it was the bike path rapist cases. And, and I said, yes. And I spent the next eight years chasing the bike path rapist. And in those eight years, you know, I, I, the word consumed that Michelle McNamara used, you do become consumed uh, because everyone in Western New York was touched by the bike path rapist in some way. And when I opened that binder, I saw that one of the victims was someone I had gone to high school with. And so all of a sudden, as, and I, Linda Yalem, uh, the, his um, first murder victim went to UB and I was, that's where I had been going to school was the University of Buffalo. So there was a connection. And now here's another connection that makes it so personal. And I, with what we had, you know, and I, I didn't, I didn't really realize the magnitude of it until I got to cold case um, of how little information was shared between uh, police departments in the nineties before the internet, you know, um, and, you know, working with what we had, you know, I was, you know, bringing my partners in, I was bringing, we had uh, victims advocates that worked with us um, from crisis services, um, you know, bringing them in and having them help me. And, you know, they moved our, our squad around a lot. And we, we, they actually put us on a building, we got our own building for a little while on Elk Street. And my Lieutenant actually gave me my own room to put all my bike path rapist things in. And I had maps on the wall and DNA profiles and sketches. And, you know, it becomes, it becomes very easy to fall down that rabbit hole of becoming consumed by it. And then fast forward uh, to, um, to 2006, uh, September, uh, Joan Diver's body is found. And the bike path rapist had not been heard of in years, heard from in years, I should say. And all of a sudden he's back again. And they decided to, the powers that be decided to put together a task force. And I was put on the task force, uh, myself and my partner at the time, who became my partner, uh, was Dennis Delano. He was in the newly formed cold case squad. I was from the, the sex offense squad and they put us together on the task force. And in January of uh, 2007, we arrested Altimio Sanchez as the bike path rapist. And, you know, a lot of this played out in the, in the newspaper. And during that time when we were looking for him and trying to track him down, using the evidence, now finally with the task force, we had Amherst police, we had the state police, we had the sheriff's department, we had, we had all the pieces of the puzzle finally together in one spot. And it really is what broke the case open. And in the course of the investigation, we realized that we had this possibly innocent man, Anthony Capozzi, in jail for rapes that the bike path rapist committed. And it was a very um, difficult process to prove that you know he had been convicted at trial, so we had to find evidence to overcome that, which turned out to be the missing slides in at ECMC, which proved that Anthony Capozzi did not commit those rapes; that it was the bike path rapist. And you know, getting uh, Anthony Capozzi out of jail after 22 years in prison was just an, a mentally and emotionally just. You know, you. It is the it is the thing, the the reason why you get into law enforcement. It is the thing that puts meaning. You get a serial killer off the street and get an innocent person out of jail, and that is supposed to be 
a once in a career happening. And then, you know, Dennis Delano and I both go to cold case. I, I, I left um, sex offense and went to cold case. And about nine months later, we realized that there's a woman sitting in jail by the name of Lynn Dijak for the murder of her daughter. And we realized that she might be innocent too. And we uncovered the DNA evidence that event that led to her exoneration. And so, you know, twice in a year is not supposed to happen. So at that point I was physically, mentally and emotionally ex exhausted. And I had to have an outlet. I had to have a healthy outlet. I couldn't do um, what you see on the TV shows, you know, fall into a bottle. I had two young, I had two young children at home. I had a, a three and a five-year-old at home. Um, so I had, to, I had to do something positive. And I had always been a writer. I had always wanted to write. And so I, um, and I believe everything happens for a reason. I really do. And my husband's best friend happened to open a bookstore. And, and it's here in South Buffalo. It's called Dog Years Bookstore and it's wonderful. And he started a writer's group. And I started taking all, and as a, as a police detective and as a police officer, you always have a notebook on you. And I was always making little notes. If I saw something interesting, I'd write it down in my little notebook. And I, if I, I thought of like maybe a scene or something struck me, I would write it down. And it was there at Dog Ears after all this happened that I started putting all those little notes together. And over the course of literally eight years, those um, became the, the start of my, my first book, um, A Cold Day in Hell, which is, is not true. It's um, absolute fiction, but it was, it, it was directly from having to have a healthy outlet for the things that I had experienced on the job. And, you know, and, and maybe it's, you know, my, um, my outlet, my main character, uh, Lauren Riley, gets herself into a lot of trouble. And she's always trying to do the right thing, what she thinks is the right thing. And uh, she, uh, she's a very good character um, to have bad things happen to, because then I get to write the ending and hopefully eventually right the wrongs. And so I got, um, so I retired in 2015 and this book was published in 2018. So three years, three years after I retired, my first book came out and it sort of, my writing career sort of snowballed from there. My second and third book came out in 2019. And then I had two more books come out uh, this year in 2020, which was the um, fourth book in my series, which is the Cold Case Investigation series. And then this fifth book, which is the standalone, which is The Secrets They Left Behind. So my journey from police officer to writer is, is directly connected. And my character of Shay is a much different character than my main character in my series. She's much younger. You know, my main character in my cold case series um, is, you know, is divorced. She has kids. Her kids are actually in college. Um, where Shay is, she's only 23, so she's young to begin with. And uh, she is, she has, um, she has emotional scars from the job already, um, from some of the things she's experienced. And the, the powers that be kind of use that against her. And I, I really, there's a special place in my heart for this book because I really feel for the, the main character, that young, that young cop, because there's so many things that I would love to, to tell her. And um, an advice I would love to give her, you know, that I, I wish someone had given me. 
and um, once again, the word consumed, she becomes consumed with finding out what happened to these girls. It becomes personal for her. And the, the longer she stays undercover, the more she is invested in the case. And, you Can know- Can I interrupt yes. you for a minute, Lisa? Sure. Um, I really enjoyed Shay. And um, in fact, that was one of my favorite parts of the book is like she hangs with the murder, well, the disappeared girls. She hangs out with their best friends and she be, she goes to school. Um, it's like a junior college age, right? Yeah, so she's, she's, it's, a, it's a community college. Yeah, she passes for an 18 or 19 year old and she gets really close to these girls. Um, and you just did that so well. I'm wondering, were you able to recall your own years at, at that age? I mean, it was just the picture you painted of their life and their the way they communicated with each other and the hanging out and the you know a little bit of drinking and pizza and the guys and the whole the whole picture just the way they talked to each other was terrific. So, did you draw on your own? teen years or did you your daughters your, your kids <laughs> I, I drew I drew heavily on my uh, my older daughter was she graduated from high school in 2020 so she was she was 16 17 right when I was writing the book and I, I definitely her I would listen to her how she spoke to her friends and how they would speak to her and the things that they did. And I definitely uh, drew a, a lot on her. Well, you did a, a great job of that. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, also, like I, I've, I've read all your, your books and Lauren Riley is the protagonist in what, four of them or? Yes. Yeah. And then the Shay is all by herself. But I noticed that they almost get killed each one. <laughs> Like they, they all go through these, you know, getting beat up, shot in various things, or at least I put down three out of four times. So what is that about? I mean, were you personally ever injured or experienced partners being hurt like that? Uh, well, you know, obviously the nature of police work is dangerous, but I'm also, I'm writing fiction and to you know to create the story you have to have obstacles and when you're writing crime fiction they have to be big obstacles and high stakes if uh, if 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 i did a it, you know a lot of real police work especially cold cases is a lot of waiting it's a lot of waiting around it's waiting for dna reports to come in it's waiting for phone calls it's waiting for you know the, the district attorney to call you back. It's waiting to talk to your lieutenant. It's waiting to talk to a witness. It's a lot of waiting, and that would make a very, very, very boring book. Sure. So, you know, you have to take some license with the action because, you know, as a reader, the reader wants action. You know, and the reader also wants to see that, you know, the main character can overcome these obstacles in their way. You know, once again, it'd be a very boring book if, you know, sort of nothing happened to them. So unfortunately for my characters, I throw everything but the kitchen sink at them, you know, and then they have to try to figure it out, you know, and, and it's, it's how they figure it out. Is it always, is it always right? Is it always the right thing? Do they do the wrong thing sometimes to do the, to get the right results? Yeah, sometimes, you know, um, I tried to make, they're both, they're two very, very different characters, but I tried to give them multifaceted personalities so that they weren't just these sort of cut out cardboard. Uh, like my, my main character in my, um, in my cold case series, Lauren Riley, like I said, she's older. Uh, she starts off in my my first book, you know, and I've heard from people say, you know, why do you have to make her tall and blonde and leggy and beautiful? But in my books, time 
actually passes, it, she, it, it's not static. The series is not static. So time passes and my character gets older. And as these things happen to her, she's, she, and you know, as you get older, obviously gravity is terrible to women, uh, you know, she starts to lose her looks and just as the natural progression of things. So she starts out one way, but by the time she's in the fourth book, you know, she's barely recognizable from the character she started out in, in the first book, just because time and situations have happened to her, like they happen to us all, you know, and that's, that's a realistic depiction of, you know, of, of life, you know, it, it wears you down and, you know, Shay in The Secrets They Left Behind is still young and resilient where um, Lauren's a little bit more set in her ways and is having a hard time with both of her daughters being gone. She had spent so much time, her daughters are both in college and she had spent so much time being a single mom, you know, they say, uh, what is it? Idols hands are the devil's playground. And that's what sort of gets her in trouble is she does private investigations on the side and she knows she shouldn't take this particular case and she does it anyways. And it gets her in trouble and, and the action rolls from there. But once again, how, how she starts out in book one is not how she ends up in books, you know, four and five. She is, you know, she, she changes and grows. She does not stay static. Um, so are, are oh, you, sorry, sorry. Stephen. Uh, I'm just gonna hop in with just a, one of our participant questions um, from Mary Lou. Were you were your initial experiences at the uh, Buffalo Police Department similar to Laura's in Cold Day in Hell? We are currently, uh, we read recently in another book club and some woman had difficulty understanding the sexism at work and her reoccurrent misogynistic relationships. She also says, and yes, Shay really seemed to lose her caution as her relationship with Nick progressed. She says she hasn't finished the book yet. She's two out of three though. <laughs> so, you know, and I, I've, I've gotten that question before. So yeah, you know, you know, Lauren, def I think in any male dominated profession, you're going to run into some sexism. And I, you know, I, I did highlight a little bit of that, um, but and she was in a relationship with, uh, an, you know, her ex-fiance was abusive, you know, physically abusive, you know, and she put up with that. And people ask me about that all the time. And I say, no, you know, that wasn't my experience, but did I know female cops that that happened to? Absolutely. And, you know, so what, what you try to, like, once again, what you try to do when you're creating a character is make them multifaceted, you know? So while there is an abusive ex-boyfriend, there's also her relationship with her partner who they have this, this great platonic relationship. So there's a balance to that, you know, um, just like in, in, in real life, you know, you can have a boss who's a total jerk to you and you can't stand him, but then you have a, a coworker who is the person patting you on the shoulder and saying, don't worry, I have your back. And that's what I was trying to show with Lauren. But, and once again, as the series goes on, you see that she puts up with that less and less and less because she's growing as a person, you know, it, in her personal life and her professional life as the series goes on. So you do see that if you've read the first book and you were bothered by that, if you, if you, if I can, if I can keep you interested and you keep on reading, you'll see that she grows as a person and doesn't put up with that anymore. She doesn't, I think it, I think up until a certain point, she felt like she had to put up with it. And then I think as women, we reach a certain age and we're like, you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm not putting up with this, you know? And she, you know, she, she, like I said, she grows, my character grows along with the story. We have one more question from Andrea. Uh, jumping back a little bit for something you said earlier, 
Um, she, Andrea wants to know, could you tell us a bit about the missing slides from ECMC? Oh, so, so when we were um, investigating, we had heard from, um, from a nurse that there were these, supposed, there were supposed to be slides at ECMC from old rape kits. But then when we contacted ECMC, they said there were no slides. But then we were getting, we're, so we were getting conflicting information that they, these slides existed, then they didn't. And then lo and behold, ECMC um, found the slides. And in these slides of old rape kits, it, they were in a cabinet, um, were the slides taken from the rape victims going all the way back into the 80s. And so we were able to prove using those slides that had been stored and nobody to this day, I don't think we've ever gotten a good answer about why they were stored, who kept them and why they still kept them. Because th there, is a there is a statute of limitations. The statute of limitations on rape at the time um, was 10 years. So they were, they were no good as, you know, as evidence per se to, to convict someone. So why they kept them, we have, we have no one has a really, a, no one's ever really explained that in a, in a good way for us. So once again, you know, was that a little bit of, um, you know, divine intervention? Maybe because it, that those were the, those slides were what got Anthony Capozzi out of jail. Well, that's it for the Q&A for, for now. Jasira, do you have any more questions for Lisa? I have a question, Lisa. Okay. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about your what you took in college and how you ended up being a police officer, a detective ultimately, and then we know how you transition from being a detective to being an author. But if you could talk a little bit about your early career and how it all happened. So I went to, uh, I started out at uh, ECMC, ECMC, Erie Community College. I, I never worked for ECMC. <laughs> I started out at Erie Community College and then I transferred, I did about two years there and then I transferred to the University of Buffalo. And my major and what I graduated from the University of Buffalo, I have a bachelor's in interdisciplinary studies with a concentration in legal studies, which qualifies me to do nothing. Well, it qualifies me to be a cop. So I was taking that when I took the police exam. And um, so I had to finish, I had to work. I, had, I worked from nine at night till seven in the morning in my first assignment at Precinct 5 on the West Side at Grant and Ferry. And so I worked from that at night till seven in the morning. And then I would drive at seven in the morning to my eight o'clock class at UB. So, you know, so I, it, you know, and it took me a long time to finally finish out my degree. Um, I had originally thought that I had wanted to be a lawyer, but strike that, go back even farther. I had originally wanted to be a, a journalist. I had originally wanted to be a journalist, but there just were no jobs in Buffalo, you know, with, um, it being, you know, with the only um, the only the Buffalo News, I would have had to, you know, move away, and so then I switched my focus that maybe I'd want to be a lawyer. So that was what I was going. That was what my goal was. But then once I took the police exam, you know, I wanted to be a I wanted to be a cop more than anything. And once I got on the the job and got on patrol, I used to see the detectives working while I was working. And I really, um, and I, I, I started at precinct uh, five on the west side and then I get transferred to precinct three, which is a theater district. But it also had Abel in it. And working midnights, I would call the Buff General Hospital a lot. And I would see the detectives come in, especially on domestic violence calls and sexual assaults 
And I thought, you know what? I want to, I want to do that. I though I want to, I want to help. This is what I want to do, you know? And the detective exam came around and I took the detective exam and I scored high in the list and they made me detective and I had my choice of assignments and I chose to go to our special victims unit, which handled domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, elder abuse and missing persons. And I thought if, if, I, could, if I could help the people that, that come through that department, then maybe, maybe I, I, I can make a difference. And I'd like to think, I, I'd like to think that I did, you know, I spent um, over seven years there and it was very, it was, it was very hard, but it was at the same time, it was very gratifying. And then from, from then from there, we go back into the, um, into the bike path case, which led me to go to cold case. Mm -hmm. And I did spend eight years in cold case as well, you know, um, and, you know, that too uh, was extremely, when, when you can give a family that closure, it just is, um, it, it, it is so gratifying. Like I'm a wordsmith and I, I get choked up and I get at, at a loss for words about that, you know, and I'm, um, I'm very proud of my time and the people that I worked with in cold case and in the sex offense squad, the work that they did and do is, is amazing. Um, Lisa, you mentioned that you were always writing. Did you start writing did you like keep a journal? Did you write in high school? And um, I know dog ears was helpful, but, but what, what other practices helped you like make it a serious thing instead of, um, you know, a hobby or a respite from your work? Ever since I can remember, I've always wanted to be a writer. I remember being young maybe seven or eight years old. And instead of asking for Barbie dolls, I asked for a typewriter. And I remember getting this typewriter, it was this little metal typewriter. It was metal and plastic and it had the ribbon and it had the little keys that you had to, and the keys would stick and you had to pry them off. <laughs> and I would write uh, choose your own adventure stories for my friends. And I, and I give them as gifts to my friends. And I can, I can always remember writing you know and even as a as a high schooler you know i would write short stories or what i what i thought were short stories now i realize were just you know little vignettes of little slices of life um but i was always writing always you know and even into my um even into my into my 20s you know as a young police officer like i said i would always have a notebook and would be constantly if I saw something that I thought was interesting and now I do it on my phone and if you open up my phone I'll have in my notes section I'll put in you know if I look at it right now you'll see you know beat up Ford pickup with a rusty tailgate you know and I'll just put that in there or um, plastic bag caught in the bushes just little things that you see yeah. that you can add into the layers of your stories, you know, or I remember I went to an orthodontist appointment and the woman behind the desk had crooked teeth. And I remember thinking, don't they have a, a, a employee, you know, you know, discount here, but you know, and it is as weird as it may seem that, you know, but little things like that, you, you, you tuck it away and you, you, you save it for later because you never know what that will spark, you know, farther on down the road. That, that might explain this wonderful phrase that I kept, wrote down reading the, the latest book, which is, I guess it was a cat was purring like a revving semi. Oh, that's my cat. Yeah. That's, that's my cat. That's my, cat, my ungrateful cat. cat, my ungrateful cat that right. sits by my head and, 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 purr so loud you could probably hear it in the next room mm -hmm. 
so yeah, I'm always looking for those those similes and those metaphors all around us because they are all around us, right. you know. And um, and what is about it? plotting? That that's amazing. Like uh, Shay has a backstory that could be a whole book, and like and you tease us with it. Like we never, you know, I don't want to give any of it away, but you know, she has a dramatic backstory, let's put it, but you don't learn much of it until a certain point. Um, so, you know, so that that's, that's one of the things that I had to learn to go from uh, like police writing because police writing is very dry and just the facts, ma'am, you know, you know, you know, subject did X and then did Y and then Z, where, you know, you have to be much more descriptive uh, when you're writing fiction. And like with Shay, you know, being young, everything is new to her. So you have to remember how to look at things with those young eyes, as opposed to I, when Lauren looks at things, she's looking at through the lens of someone who's, you know, pushing, you know, she's middle-aged as opposed to someone in their twenties where everything is still so new. So, you know, you have to, you know, you have to kind of view those, view through those different lenses. Um, and one of the, so my, my fourth book takes place in, most of it takes place, well, 50-50 takes place in Iceland because uh, my main character has to go to Iceland to, to, to talk to people. And I, I did go, go to Iceland and do, and do some research. And a lot of the little details that I thought were so striking, like one thing is um, women would leave babies in baby carriages outside of, in the cold, outside of, of um, coffee shops and just leave them. And I remember being shocked by that, but that was normal to them. The babies were all bundled up and they were in their carriages and, uh, and, and that made it into my book because my main character was shocked by that. So you always have to try to think of how your character would react to seeing something for the first time and, and, what, and what, what lens they would view it through as a middle-aged woman or as a woman in her young 20s. You know, maybe someone that didn't have kids wouldn't think that, wouldn't be aghast at that and just be like, eh. but you know, a mom is a mom. You're like, oh my God, where's the mom with these babies? You know, so you always have to kind of view it through what, the lens of your character when you're looking, when you're looking for those little details to throw into your book. I just like to mention something about Shay being so young. Do you know whether it appealed to a younger audience? Have you gotten any feedback? Uh, you know, I I know that I know that some of of my readers that had read uh, the Lauren Riley series were not um, were not as taken by Shay because they wanted more Lauren Riley. And as a writer, you can you have to, you know, you have to kind of stretch your wings and, you know, pull, you know, I mean, I could just keep writing Lauren Riley, you know, but I think eventually that for me as a writer would, you know, you love, you know, you, you know, you get to know your characters. I know everyone in Lauren's world, but it's sort of like being stuck with them 24 seven. And you love you, and they're like family, but you love your family, but sometimes you gotta get away from your family. So that's where Shay comes in. So now, you know, I branched out into this new sort of new world, brand new, you know, I made up the town, which I love that, that because you get free reign. If you make up a town, you can do whatever you want. And um, I also write short stories you know, I, I obviously I have um, a short story in Buffalo Noir, but I also write science fiction and horror, but I write it under a different name. And I do that to kind of clear out the cobwebs of mystery. Like, you know, you, 
you can be come up to here with your writing. So you have to branch off and write, you know, maybe science fiction because it's something totally different. And, and it takes you out of, out of the worlds that you've built into a different world for a little while. And then you can come back and dive right back in. And um, like Mary said, with the secrets they left behind, I had to layer Shay's present and her past. And I had to do that very carefully to reveal certain things at certain times, you know? And so that did take some plotting and planning, you know? And, and that's a lot of work. Uh, the, the fifth book in my series I'm working on right now is a locked door mystery. And that, which means it's going to take place in a spa, sort of in a town sort of south of Ellicottville where the, everyone gets snowed in. And it's more in the vein of Agatha Christie where I want to try to invite the reader to solve the crime along with my main character by implant clues and red herrings so it's, that's very, it's very much like, um, once again, like Agatha Christie in that sense. And hopefully I'll get it right. And it's very difficult to do because, and that's, it's taking a lot of plotting and planning. Um, but once again, the secrets they left behind that too. Uh, well, I wasn't able to guess the ending as I shared with you. Well, then my work is done. <laughs> then my work is done. So we have one other uh, question from our participant, Cheryl. She says, thank you for making such a difference in people's lives through your career as a uh, police officer and an author. In this book, you portrayed an officer undercover and the complexities and conflicts that develop while bonding with individuals for the purpose of investigation. At the end of the book, Shay seems to experience guilt and loss from forming relationships to obtain information and losing those relationships afterward. In her case, she was able to continue the relationship she valued, but in reality, maybe things may not always work out. Any comments on how the loss of relationships formed while undercover can be justified as a part of the job and not result in guilt and burnout? So, and um, I had talked a little bit about this. Uh, so, you know, she she's doing, she, she about being consumed and then, eventually the cases end and you're left to pick up the pieces. And I talked a little bit about this with the bike path case. How do you pick up the pieces? So for me, I had a husband and children at home. I, what's my outlet, you know? And it was, for me, it was writing, you know? And, you know, she's, she is consumed by, from guilt. You know, she's asking herself, did I do the right thing? You know, I got the right results, but did it, you know, was it the right thing to do, you know? And I, I think part of that goes back to when you, in her mind, her friendships were legitimate with these, with these girls. She formed legitimate bonds with these girls and she wasn't faking that, but she's not the person they thought she was. So she feels guilt because she feels like she, because she did, she lied and she let them down. And she, but she, she sort of feels that the whole way through. But yeah, um, and I was, I was under cover a, a few times, but, but only for very brief periods of time. Um, but I do know people that have been undercover for extended periods of time. And they did wrestle with that because, you know, they are basically, for some, in, in some cases, they're basically betraying people that consider them their friends, you know? And it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and once again, I tried to show it through the lens of, would, would my Lauren Riley character take an assignment like that? No, because she's older and she knows better. Would a 23 year old take that assignment? Yeah, because you know she she's still a, a true believer and she really wants to, you know, she really wants to prove that and she's trying to prove herself to make a difference. But then, you know, 
then then she's left to deal with the aftermath on her own you know you know they will the police will the police departments provide you know psychological help yeah they will but will cops go and get it you know no maybe probably not you know they figure they have to deal with it on their own you know so yeah um so what you see in Shay's case is she you know she goes through all this and then she's got to deal with the fallout you know and you know hopefully she you know once you do a case like that you're able to pick up the pieces will we will we meet Shay again I don't know I, I don't know I'm I'm really on the fence about that. I I don't know. I I I cannot I cannot give a yes or no on that one. I I do if if we do see her again, she will be older. Some significant a significant amount of time will have passed on her career if I if I if I bring her back again. It won't be, you know, all my cold case books happen within months of each other. Um where her I would give her I I give her a little bit of a break, give her a couple of years and leave her alone where I threw some more stuff at her. One of my favorite fun things about reading your books is the Buffalo, uh, you know, the, the, the sites, the different things that happen that are Buffalo. And I notice, well, like, you know, Allentown and um, just there's lots of them, but I notice you twist them just a little bit, just enough that the you know they're not you can't go there and find that corner but to the people who are local it's it's just very fun um and yet it's fiction you know so you put your own stamp on it um so you were talking i was kidding around that this did you mention in your new book there's there's going to be a stolen painting that's yes. that i was going to try to um have you be make it a Charles Birchfield <laughs> instead of a Picasso? But no, yeah, it's already it's, it's already in London at the publisher. So oh, okay, okay, too late, too late. So that's too late. Although I I love I love Charles Birchfield's work. I love it. It I look at his paintings, and especially with the factories in the background, and having grown mm -hmm. up in Woodlawn between the Ford plant and the steel plant. And that's sort of the brown and gray and right. just the the melting the snow melting with the factories in the background that just it so reminds me of where i'm from just mm -hmm. it really it really touches me so right. it's it's just amazing amazing he's an amazing um, artist do you do you consciously put buffalo illusions in or local things in or do you I mean how do you approach that or is it just part of your imagination that I, I I do throw a lot of Easter eggs in my books you know so that maybe only Buffalo people will catch but sometimes oh, yeah sometimes my my editor you know editor will say no <laughs> like you know um we say use guys mm -hmm no one else says that and i'm like well it's sort of the buffalo version of y'all you know but we're you know we can't you know i you know they won't let me put use hey use guys you know um another buffaloism you know is our love of tim hortons coffee how mm -hmm. there's a tim hortons and i don't think i met i don't think i managed to get tim hortons into my books until my third book mm -hmm. i finally managed to get tim hortons into um because I, I believe my um, my um, main character's partner says there's a Tim Hortons or or my, no I think it's actually Lauren Riley says well there's a Tim Hortons five minutes away from there and he says well there's a Tim Hortons five minutes away from everywhere in right. Buffalo you know right. um, the one place I have not managed to um, sneak in is Wegmans have not managed to get a Wegmans in there um, but I'm always trying to show one thing I, I I purposely tried to leave out was, you know, chicken wings. You know, we're so tied yeah. up with chicken wings, and the, um, bills. and the bills. You know, I tried to stay away from the sports and the chicken wings right. because then it becomes a, a cliche. You yeah. know, what do we what do we want people that aren't from Buffalo to know about us? Uh, that's why my first book takes place 
in the cold case series takes place in Buffalo in the summer, it starts during a heat wave because it gets hot in Buffalo. It gets right. really hot in Buffalo, you know? Mm -hmm. And I wanted, so I wanted to show all the different seasons of the year, you know, that happen in Buffalo, that Buffalo is so much more than chicken wings. It's so much more. You know, I, I mentioned the Albright Knox Art Gallery because that's a, a jewel, you know? I mentioned the Buffalo Zoo. I mentioned, you know, all these great, you know, canal side, which I actually had to add into my first book because it wasn't, when I started writing it, like I said, my first book, it took me eight years to write because I was still working. I was still on the job. When I started writing it, canal side didn't exist. And then right before it got uh, picked up by my publisher, it did exist. So I had to add it in at the last minute. So, you know, you're always, you know, the city's changing. So you have to change the city with it, you know, with, with your writing, you know, to reflect what's going on. Like I predicted in my books that police headquarters would change. And then it actually did. But that was a rumor literally from the day I got on the job back in, you know, 1993, they were saying, oh, they're going to move police headquarters. They're going to move police headquarters. Well, I wrote three books or, you know, two works, sorry, I wrote two books, three, no, three books, I wrote three books, and then they, and then they moved police headquarters, so in a full cold moon, I actually had to go and make an appointment, because I was retired, and get a tour of the new police headquarters, someone actually had to take me around on a tour, like a tourist, to see the new police headquarters, because I was a civilian, you know, but they finally moved police headquarters after 20 years. So my books had to reflect that, but I had no idea what police headquarters looked, the new one looked like. So I had to go and take a tour of it. Uh, when we when we chatted, you told me that you're the vice president of the Buffalo chapter of Sisters in Crime. Can you tell us, those who don't know what that is, tell us a little bit about that? So Sisters in Crime is an organization that promotes uh, Myst women writing mysteries, but we are we also include men. Men are involved in our chapters as well. We call them our misters, misters in crime. And it is a phenomenal organization. And we meet, we used to meet before COVID, we used to meet once a month, the first Saturday of the month in Rochester um, at a, a our meeting place in Rochester. We have programs. Uh, where we work on craft. We just did a program on writing uh, Barbara Early, who is also a Buffalo author. She writes um, the Bloom and Doom flower shop mysteries for Berkeley. Uh, she's wonderful. And she also writes the toy um, shop mysteries, that, which are set in East Aurora. She, um, we did a workshop on writing query letters and query letters are what you need to land an agent. You have to write a query letter about your book. And so we did a workshop on that. And it was through mystery writers, or excuse me, it was through Sisters in Crime and our little, and it's a very, very, very new chapter. We've, we haven't been around that long and it's a very small chapter, but one of the things that National did was they send us guest speakers. And one of the guest speakers they sent was a woman by the name of Jess Lowry, who you, some of you may have read her book. It's called Unspeakable Things. Um, it's a bestseller. And she came, um, that's, sorry, that's one of her books. She's written, I believe, over 20. Um, she came to our little chapter and she talked to us. And as we were talking, she asked me about my manuscript. And I told her about it. And she said, well, you know, you should probably send it to my publishing house, to my acquiring editor. And so I did. And lo and behold, you know, I, I got offered, a, I got offered a book deal, you know, just because someone in Sisters in Crime heard my idea for my book, thought it sounded good, said, you know what, I think my editor would like that, said, send it along. And that's what we do. We help each other. We help each other along. And two members of Sisters of Crime had helped me with my query letter because I had to send my manuscript with, with a query letter that two other members of Sisters of Crime helped me write. And 
I actually used the query letter I had been using and getting all kinds of rejections for. It was awful. And the one that got me my book deal, I actually used them when we just did another query letter shop and I put them side by side and showed everyone the difference between the two, like night and day, and how if I hadn't joined Sisters in Crime, I never would have gotten my book deal. So networking, uh, to be you know to be a published author, networking is very important. You know, to, you know, writing a good book is the most important thing. But you know, you want to you want to network and you want to join organizations and you want to make connections with other authors because they. Unlike other um, occupations, you're not in competition with other writers because nobody reads just one author. Most people read numerous authors. So all the authors, and it's, it's been so uplifting to meet all these men and women that just everybody just wants you to, to do well and they wanna help you and they want you to, they want your book to, to sell and they, they're willing to help you and they'll give you blurbs, which are those little, if you look on the, on, you know, the, the covers of a book, you'll see the little blurb saying, you know, the, you know, I read this book and it's, it's, it's a great book. You know, people are, you know, other writers are so supportive. It's a really wonderful community. It's, I, I can't talk, I can't say enough about it. Uh, and being a member of Sisters in Crime, is just it has it it helped me not only did it help me become a better writer it directly helped me get published so and if anyone's interested in it um they can contact me through my web my website it's my name www.lisamarieredmond.com and i have on my website i have it'll say contact if you go through my contact that goes right to my email and if you're interested in joining Sisters in Crime, our Sisters in Crime group here in Western New York, just shoot me an email and I'll make sure that you get, you know, or whoever gets the information they need to join. It's a really wonderful. Can you can you tell how much I love it? It's a really <laughs> wonderful organization. Thank you. Lisa, you mentioned a really generous idea and fun idea about giving one of your books to our participants. Um, do you want to do that now? We're, we're getting along in time. Okay. So I, I love to do book giveaways. I love to give back to the community. I love everyone in Western New York has been so supportive of me. I love to, to give back. So I'm writing a book right now. Once again, it's sort of an Agatha Christie locked door mystery. You got to figure out who done it. And it's set in a hotel slash spa and the my main character and all the suspects are snowed in and it's very reminiscent of the November storm snowvember the wall of snow coming over the lake if anyone can remember what year snowvember happened the first person who comments with the right year can have uh, any one of my first three books. If you've already read A Cold Day in Hell, you can have the murder book. If you've already read the murder book, oh, I'm sorry. If you've already read the murder book, you can get a means to an end. So any use, use the chat section here. Whoever's the first one will get a free book. Look, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl the correct the answer. First one with the correct answer. Does she have the correct answer? 2014. 2014. Yes. yes, she does. That was fast, Cheryl. So Cheryl, um, I can reach out to you uh, via email and we can connect with Lisa for you to get your book. Congratulations. I hope you like it. Whichever one you pick, I hope you like it. So Lisa, I don't think you have any spare time, but if you did, like, what, what do you like to do? Do you read? Do you watch uh, crime dramas on TV? <laughs> I sort of think you don't, right? Well, I'm, I still have a, a daughter here at home with me. She's in high school. Right. Uh, I read every night, every night. I, I consider that my homework assignment. Um, I, 
I don't, I'm going to quote someone and I can't remember who, who said, you can't be a writer if you're not a reader. So I do read every single night. Uh, I love, I'm very much in, when I was, when I was a police officer, I was an extrovert. Since I've retired, I have very much become an introvert. I'm, and I am a homebody. I stay at home a lot and you know, I, I put her around the house. Before COVID, I did a lot of traveling for my writing, you know, going to a lot of conferences and going to a lot of book clubs. That would be my night out. Like if, if you had invited me to come to the Birchville Penny Center and talk to your book club, that would be my, my day out. You know, that was, you know, enough for me. Um, but I'm very much, I'm very much an introvert. And I think that is one of the reasons why, you know, I can spend so much time concentrating on my writing because I, I live inside my own head, you know, well, we're, no. all, we're all benefiting by that. And, and we can stay home curled up reading a, the latest Lauren Riley. <laughs> um, were, were there any more burning questions or uh, if not, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Mary. Yeah, there's no more Q and A's, so Mary, you can go ahead. Well, I thought Lisa would read a little snippet from her. Oh new yes, book. yes, yes. From your newer book, from your newest. Oh, oh, okay. So, yeah. so this Terrific. is. I I'll, I'll read a little a little snippet from the Parting Glass, which is coming out in July, and. I'm going to start, I'm going to start a little farther in, but I'm going to start where my main character, Lauren Riley, meets a woman who wants to hire her as a private detective. Mrs. Hathaway had been convinced Lauren had only married Mark for his trust fund money and had spent their entire brief marriage in a constant state of passive aggressive uptight politeness toward her. How is Mrs. Hathaway, Lauren asked. Still battling her arthritis, I'm afraid but I didn't bring you here to catch up on the latest society gossip. I'm involved in a matter that's been going on for over 40 years and I need someone I can trust, Sharon Whitley said. 40 years is a long time, Lauren commented. You're a cold case detective, she replied, rubbing her thumb absently over the rim of her cup, erasing the red lipstick she just deposited there. Doesn't get much colder than this. She took a deep breath and went on. 40 years ago, I met Howard Whitney. I was 25 and a bit naive and he was 45 and divorced. I had just graduated with my master's degree in fine arts and was working in a very exclusive New York City art gallery. I'm originally from Long Island, the Hamptons actually. When Lauren didn't react to that revelation one way or another, she went on. He was a friend of the gallery owner and an art collector who spent a ridiculous amount on pieces. He did have excellent taste, I gotta give him that. The attraction between us was immediate and so was the friction, I suppose. She smiled faintly at the memory. We got married three months after we met. There was no prenuptial agreement. I came from money, he had money. There didn't seem to be a need. A few days before we wed, he bought a small Picasso the gallery's owner had managed to get his hands on. I absolutely loved it and he gave it to me as a wedding gift. Lauren let out a sigh. I think I know where this is going. We were married for 20 tumultuous years, she went on as if Lauren hadn't spoken at all. We finally decided to divorce each other. Neither one of us would give an inch about anything. He refused to move out of our house. I refused to move out of our house. I wanted the painting and he didn't want to give it to me. The famous Whitney break-in, Lauren interrupted. If that flustered her, she didn't show it. There was no break-in. My husband was home alone. I had gone out to dinner and drinks with the, some friends. And when I came back around one in the morning, I found him on the floor of our living room, beaten almost to death and the painting was gone. Wasn't a handyman thought to be involved, Lauren? Had been a young mother when the crime happened. It had been all over the news for days, a bitter divorce, both parties still living together in their city mansion, a brutal assault, missing art, and a trusted household employee under suspicion. It had all the makings of a Lifetime movie before Lifetime movies were a thing. I'm convinced my ex-husband set up the entire affair with James Patrick Brian, our employee, to make it look like a robbery gone bad. Our security system hadn't been breached. It was definitely an inside job, as they say. She leaned forward now, arms crossed over her knees. Miss Riley, 
that painting is still out there and I want it back. The crime had topped the headlines for weeks at the time, but Lauren was still foggy on the details. Though it had taken place in Buffalo, the cold case squad only worked homicides and it would have been handled by the precinct detectives at the time, probably with the help of the FBI. However, Lauren knew that the statute of limitations on assault and robbery would long have since passed. The file would have been closed and sent to the police department's archives years ago. She didn't know how the FBI managed their cold cases, but she imagined a similar scenario. Mr. Breen was investigated and cleared, wasn't, she? wasn't he? She asked. Sharon took another sip of her tea and nodded. The, the authorities searched him in his apartment on our property right after the crime, but the painting was never located. There wasn't enough evidence to charge him with anything. He said he was watching television alone when it happened. My ex-husband claimed he didn't remember anything, but getting hit from behind as he walked into our living room. James moved out immediately and then went back to his native Ireland less than a year later. Fled back to Ireland is more like it. Did he suddenly become a millionaire? Sharon Whitney shook her head and gave Lauren a knowing smile. Wouldn't that have been convenient? Sadly, no. He's been living in the same ramshackle cottage for the last 20 years. It was time for Lauren to get to the huge looming elephant in the room. Didn't your husband accuse you of hiring someone to steal the painting? He tossed that allegation out so I wouldn't get my half of the insurance money. But it's not about the money. It never was. Look around you. She gestured to the artwork hanging on the walls. As little as Laura knew about art, she knew a beautiful painting when she saw one. Right now, she was literally surrounded by them. I love that painting. And now I feel like there's a real chance I might get it back. Why now, Lauren asked. What's changed all of a sudden? Sharon Whitney mouth set in a grim line. James Breen died four days ago. I received a phone call in the middle of the night. She put her hand over her heart. When it rang, it nearly scared me out of my wits. It was the authorities in Ireland. Said he collapsed. Illness had gotten the better of him. He was only a year older than me. That's young, Lauren agreed neutrally, not wanting to speculate on our age. What did you do when you found out? I got in touch with my lawyer immediately and had him make Mr. Breen's sister in Ireland an offer for his cottage she couldn't refuse. There was a hint of steel in her voice. The sale was pending, but the important thing was to lock down the premises so Howard couldn't get there first. You make it sound like a race to the finish, Warren said. I'm 65. Howard is 85. If he dies now, the secret of what happened to that painting dies with him. I think there may be some clue in that cottage as, as to where Jimmy stashed the painting. Maybe the proof that Howard has had it this whole time somewhere else. Or maybe someone he knew has some information. Jimmy liked to drink and say he was involved with the IRA. We stole the painting for isn't the IRA in Northern Ireland? Sharon frowned slightly, remembering a former employee. He used to brag he was involved with them somehow, mostly when he had whiskey on his breath. Maybe he ran a safe house, I don't know. I need you to go over to County Cary and find out. Lauren poured another cup of tea and wished she had some of the Jameson she kept in her kitchen. That will come with a steep price tag. Give me a number, I'm feeling generous. Sharon's smile reappeared as she studied Lauren's face with the practice eye of a veteran gambler. Lauren wasn't stupid. She didn't know the going price for a small Picasso, but she knew it was in the millions. Maybe this wasn't all about the money, but it was definitely partly about the money. If I agree to do this, Lauren emphasized the if. There's a lot of legwork I'll have to do before I go over. I'll need to file a Freedom of Information Act request with the FBI and the Buffalo Police Departments immediately. Done and done. Sharon reached down and pulled open a drawer on the table next to her. She retrieved two folders and held them up. I needed these when we took up the insurance company to court to pay up. They paid the three million it was insured for and I had to split it with my ex. Now she laughed out loud, polite in practice like the tinkling of bells. That was the last time my husband and I were on the same side of anything. Even if I find the painting, won't its ownership still be in dispute? That knowing smile played across her lips again and she began to fan herself with the files ever so slightly. I'm not asking you to do anything illegal. At this point, this painting is still as much mine as it is his. He's 85 years old. It took over seven years to finalize our divorce. I'm willing to hold on to the painting while he sues me. That's a pleasant thought, Lauren commented. You waiting out your ex-husband's death? She leaned forward again, arms draped over her knees. I'm sure that if he got the news tomorrow that I was hit by a bus, he wouldn't shed a single tear. What a loving marriage they must have had, Lauren mused to herself. Won't your ex have people looking for the painting as well? That's why I need you to get over there as fast as possible. Tonight, ideally, but no later than tomorrow. Once Howard finds out Jimmy dies, he'll have his people combing the Irish landscape forward as well. Taking a breath, Lauren stood up. Sharon Whitley held out the paperwork to her as she crossed the room. Lauren took the files from her and said, I'll look these over. Give me a couple hours to think on this. You have until six this evening. Then I'm going to have to make a call to the next person on my list. 
Sharon made a move to stand, but Lauren held her out her free hand. Don't get up. I'll show myself out. Very good. There's an envelope attached to that first file with a check in it. Sitting back, she picked up her teacup from its saucer and took a chip. sip. Sharon Whitley's rocking back and forth in her chair was making Lauren seasick. Thank you for your time. Lauren turned, knowing she'd been dismissed and headed for the foyer. Just as she was about to exit the room, she paused, turning back to look at Sharon Whitney. What's the name of this painting anyways? Sharon's face practically glowed as she answered. Technically, it doesn't have a name. It was a small piece on a scrap of canvas he did for a friend during his rose period. It only measured 14 by nine inches, roughly. That was no answer. What was the subject matter, Lauren pressed? A harlequin standing next to a horse. That smirk came dancing back over Sharon Whitney's face. My ex-husband and I nicknamed it The Fool. Lisa, thank you so much for reading to us and for a wonderful evening and for all your great books. I'm so glad you were able to join us. Before we go, I want to thank Jasira and Michaela as well. Um, we have a lot to look forward to. And when did you say the book is coming out? July. That book is coming out in July. In July. And its name is, one more time? A Parting time. Glass. A Parting Glass for everybody. So thank you all. Before everyone goes, I just want to hope that you will note that we are meeting again in two weeks. This time we will be welcoming author Jessica Winter, who's an editor at the New Yorker magazine, who's going to launch her new book, wonderfully reviewed, I've read all the reviews, The Fourth Child. That date is March 18th and the time is our usual 6.30. So have a lovely next two weeks. Lisa, I hope you come to visit the museum and call me down. I'll be happy to give you a little bit of a tour. I'm just dying to give tours again. But I hope all of our guests out there also visit us. We're, vis we're open now on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. There's lots of new wonderful exhibitions waiting for you to visit them. And I look forward to seeing you there, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Thank you so much. And I would love to come. I would love to. Good. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in two weeks. So thank you and good night, everyone. Bye, good night. all these guys. <laughs> good night. Good night.